Um, thank you for dialing in for our monthly uh, webinar of our uh, Instruments and Future Technologies Committee. Uh, today is, uh, I believe, Three Kings Day in parts of the world. So uh, for some of you, this can be uh, a, a gift. And thank you for dialing in on a holiday. Um, today's speaker, uh, if you want to uh, share your video and uh, share your screen, Sean. So, yep, today's speaker is Sean Peters from the Naval Postgraduate School, and he will be speaking to us about leveraging ambient radio noise for passive radar sensing of the terrestrial space environment. Uh, and with that, uh, take it away, Sean. Thank you, Dusty. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. Okay, great. So yes, uh, I'm very excited to share my work. My name is Sean Peters. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Physics at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, thank you for having me here today for the IEEE Instrumentation and Future Technologies webinar. Today, I'm going to talk about our work to leverage ambient radio noise, such as the sun and Jupiter's radio emissions, as signals of opportunity for passive radar remote sensing of the terrestrial and space environment. So traditionally, when we think about these systems, right, we think about the images shown here, where we have these ice penetrating radar systems that transmit these powerful electromagnetic sources. Well, today I'm going to talk about, as a radar engineer and an instrument scientist, work that I've developed to leverage, again, these signals of opportunities such as the sun and Jupiter's radio emissions. So here are some examples of, you know, field work that I've done in Greenland as part of Dusty's group and the Stanford Radio Glaciology Group. I also had experience working at MIT Lincoln Laboratory in the Airborne Radar Systems and Techniques Group as a radar system engineer. And now I'm here at the Naval Postgraduate School uh, doing a combination of research, continuing this passive radar research, and then exploring additional radar research areas. Because when we traditionally think of radar systems, uh, we think of the examples shown at the bottom. So here I'm showing an example of an experimental radar and on the right of radar that transmits a powerful electromagnetic source. And traditionally, we're interested in detecting the echoes coming from targets of interest, whether we're interested in determining their range, their velocity, perhaps their reflectivity, which we can relate to their radar cross-section and size. We're interested in using these powerful electromagnetic signals to have as a source for remote sensing. And since World War II, we've used these radar systems, and radar has been truly an invention that has changed the world. Again, as I was saying, since World War II, we've adapted and expanded radar systems for a wide range of environmental monitoring. If you look at this image, you can see that you know, there's different remote sensing techniques for monitoring sea ice or aerosols in the atmosphere. Looking at the biosphere, radar systems that can monitor you know, tree moisture and water content. But for the focus of this talk, I'm going to discuss how we use radar remote sensing for studying the cryosphere, which consists of all the glaciers, the mountain glaciers, as well as Greenland and Antarctica, and how we use radar to study both ice thickness as well as evolving subsurface conditions. Now, why is this important? Well, going back to the main question of what we're trying to solve, we're really interested in predicting sea level rise, how much, how fast. If you look at this graph, projecting sea level rise out to the year 2100, what you can see is there's a large range of uncertainty, you know, over a half a meter of uncertainty of sea level rise projections. And this is a number that will impact the lives of millions of people. So it's crucial that we can advance technologies that can observe the processes, conditions, and physics that govern ice sheet behavior in order to obtain better predictions of their sea level rise contributions. Now, the way glaciologists currently uh, study ice sheets and their subsurface conditions, one of the main ways is by using airborne radar sounding. The idea is that we can monitor conditions within and beneath polar ice sheets by, again, transmitting those powerful electromagnetic sources and then receiving the reflections that come from the surface and subsurface. And on the right, you're looking at a map of the Antarctic radar profile coverage, where all these blue lines correspond to flight lines where we've obtained information of Antarctica's subsurface. Now, looking in more detail at the anatomy of an airborne radar sounder measurement, what you can see is after we transmit this signal, we receive the reflections from the surface, as well as internal layers, as well as the bed reflection coming from the rougher, say, bedrock in this case. So again, if say we have some chirp signal and we're interested in extracting our received signal, then as again, this info 
graphic from uh, one of my former lab mates, Riley Kohlberg shows, you can align these in range profiles and you can create a, what's known as a radargram where you can imagine this as viewing you know, the different layers from the side. So here you can see the bright surface features as well as the internal layers. And then finally the bedrock uh, as you can see. So this is really important for, again, not just observing the involving uh, conditions within the glacier, but also observing the involving conditions at the base of the system. And so it's really important to have these ice thickness measurements, which can uh, really inform our sea level rise modelers. So now thinking about these Antarctic radar profile coverage, what we do is we can combine all these information from these different uh, flight measurements and then create a map of Antarctica's subsurface, uh, as shown on the right. Now, this is really important for showing how radar, airborne radar in particular, can be used for extensive spatial coverage. However, this is limited to a snapshot in time. And often these flight lines are only done once a season, and perhaps they're never repeated at all. And what we know is that these conditions of Antarctica's subsurface evolve on a much faster rate than just over seasons, but can evolve over timescales of months, days, and even hours. So it's important that we have observations that allow us to obtain such maps of Antarctica subsurface, which higher temporal resolution. So this is where the other side of radar systems come into play, where we have these stationary ground-based radar systems that we can deploy for multiple years and obtain nearly continuous observations, however, only at a single location. So on the left is an example of an APRES, autonomous phase sensitive radar system that we deployed in Greenland, Store Glacier Greenland to observe uh, changes of the involving internal layers, as well as the bed reflection over an entire year. And so what you can see is that with this fine temporal resolution, we can look at the changes in the brightness of the layers, as well as their position to map, uh, again, changes in the internal structure of the glacier, as well as, again, that bed reflection, which gives us ideas of perhaps water storage and glacial water storage or in glacial drainage systems of this glacier. So again, it's really important that we have these continuous observations for radar uh, remote sensing of glaciers. Now, one of the issues, in addition to just being at a single location, is these stationary ground-based radar systems. If they're really expensive, it's important to consider, again, the extreme conditions that you're under. So while we could set up a very nice uh, radar system sitting on the surface of the glacier, if you come back a year later, you might find that a crevasse has opened up underneath your nicely deployed radar system. And unfortunately, in this case, the data was located in this box directly above a crass. So that was a fun experience to try to extract that data. But we were successful in doing that, and we did so in a safe way. But this is just highlighting that, again, if we think about these extreme conditions, we want a system that is pretty cheap to deploy because we don't want to worry about losing that system. So there's two sides that I've discussed so far. We have these airborne radar sounders that can provide extensive spatial coverage, right, to map flight lines over Antarctica and Greenland, but they're considered a snapshot in time. Uh, this, again, is something that is not repeated, uh, you know, on the monthly or daily timescale. This is something that perhaps is only done seasonally at best. And on the other side, we have these ground-based radar systems that can provide nearly continuous observations, but can only do do so at a single location. Now, in both cases, these existing radar systems are resource intensive in terms of cost, power, size, and logistics for continuous long-term monitoring at the ice sheet scale. And again, this is due to the fact of the need to transmit this powerful electromagnetic source. So that's where this work comes in, where we have been developing a low resource passive radar technique that eliminates the need to transmit this high power signal, and instead receives the sun's radio signals or Jupiter's radio signals to provide these temporal and spatial observations of ice sheets, ice shelves, and glaciers. Now the technique works by receiving the direct path, as well as the path that propagates through the ice and reflects off the bed, and then using an autocorrelation based technique, we're able to extract both this direct sun signal, as well as the sun's echo. Now, the reason for this is because we can treat the sun as a white noise source in our band of interest, and we use this autocorrelation technique to match that white noise with itself. So you'd expect a very fine echo peak in the autocorrelation as shown in this simulated result. So again, we have our direct sun signal, we have our sun echo, and we can use the relative delay time between those echo peaks to map to an ice thickness measurement. You can also use the relative amplitude in order to say something about the attenuation or the reflectivity uh, from the bed in order to, again, extract subsurface condition measurements. <laughs> 
Now, before we even go to the ice sheet, I want to first show our experimental progression, starting from a lab-based approach, and then also looking at uh, detecting echoes off of the surface of an ocean, where we use the sea cliff experiment to, again, detect the sun's radio uh, echo off of the surface of an ocean when it's actually as a mirror. I'm also going to show the results from our Death Valley experiments, where we extracted a rougher surface echo, which is more analogous to the bed of the ice sheet, and also how we can use this for two-dimensional imagery. Then I'll show the results of our field testing at Sword Glacier Greenland, where we use this technique to measure ice thickness for the first time. And then finally, I'll conclude by talking about the implications for planetary missions, where we could potentially design and analyze a passive HF radar that can use Jupiter's radio missions for different mission concepts, such as studying the subsurface of Europa. And in each case, it's important to remember that we're working on a passive autocorrelation-based technique that, again, extracts the amplitude and delay time of the sun's echo. So first, going back to why we even thought this was possible, if you go back to the historical sea cliff in a ferrometer experiment done by a group of radio astronomers in the 1950s, what they observed was by setting a receiver on the side of a cliff, they could extract both the direct ray as well as the reflected ray using an interference pattern technique. So what you're seeing here is the interference pattern between this direct ray and reflected ray, which then by looking at the fringes of the period you can then extract the relative position of that source. So in this case, you can use that to say, monitor the height of your cliff. Now, another thing to note though, is that this curve scale is representing intervals of 10 meters. So in order to obtain a very accurate measurement, they had to listen for tens of minutes, even hours in order to obtain an, the measurement using this interferometric metric approach. So it's really important for us that we could have a measurement that could be done much faster. And so that's where the idea of using autocorrelations came in, where we can extract the peak in the autocorrelation at the microsecond delay time between the sun's direct signal as well as the sun's echo. And we'll talk about what uh, the amount of integration time needed in order to obtain the sun echo peak. And it's much less in terms of orders of magnitude uh, compared to that interfering metric approach. And we can also talk about how this allows us to obtain uh, larger path length differences than the interfering metric approach as well. So while this is the simulated ideal case, if you actually go out to, say, Big Sur and perform this experiment and try to measure the direct path from the sun as well as the reflected path of the ocean, and you take the autocorrelation of your measurement, here we're measuring in the uh, you know, FM radio band, essentially, uh, you're looking at the autocorrelation and showing how there's peak ambiguities. So you can see these multiple peaks. And this is due to, if you look at the spectrum, the frequency domain, these large man-made sources in this case, where again, the magnitude is much greater than the background noise, where we expect the sun to be a galactic, uh, sorry, a white noise signal in the background, okay? So these peak ambiguities are something that we'll have to take into account and try to remove uh, due to this radio frequency interference in order to obtain a meaningful result. So that's where the signal processing approach that we developed comes into play, where instead of just going from a digitized sun signal directly to an autocorrelation, there were actually additional steps that we had to take into account, such as this radio frequency interference removal, as well as spectral stitching in order to obtain a wider bandwidth and improve our range resolution. So looking at the radio frequency interference removal technique, we use a power spectral density thresholding technique. So for example, if you start on the left, this is the simulated sun echo under thermal noise. You can see that there's no uh, large peaks of radio frequency interference. And if you were to take this ideal autocorrelation result, you would find a clear peak in the autocorrelation. Now, as you introduce radio frequency interference, let's assume that these are a bunch of man-made sources that are blasting loud RFI. This completely disrupts your autocorrelation. Again, we would expect to obtain a peak in the autocorrelation roughly here, but we don't see that all in this measurement because it's drowned by the RFI. Now, if you were to, say, use a thresholding technique based on the two key criteria for anomalies in exponential distribution, we can actually use a thresholding technique to essentially chop off all this RFI and very rapidly obtain our autocorrelation-based technique. Now, there's other RFI mitigation techniques that you could use, both temporally and in the frequency domain. You could use sine wave filtering, you could use notch filtering, but we found that this is a really fast computationally efficient solution in order to obtain this autocorrelation. And again, if you're trying to map and use this for onboard processing, you want a really computationally efficient solution. So this is what we found for autocorrelation echo, where we can, again, extract that original delay time as expected. 
Now, we also looked at uh, spectral stitching for bandwidth ex extension. The idea is that if you first look at what you expect for a full 16 megahertz band limit echo, in this case, you would find a very clear peak in the autocorrelation function. But if you were to just consider a subband of one megahertz, then thinking about the relationship between the size of your frequency spectrum and what that means for the main lobe in your autocorrelation, this means in this case that your autocorrelation would not be able to resolve that echo peak because your bandwidth is not sufficiently wide enough. Now, because we're measuring a white noise source, one of the ideas was to use spectral stitching in order to uh, essentially step through like a step frequency radar and combine these different bands to increase the overall effective bandwidth. And then using this technique, we were able to extract an autocorrelation echo peak, echo peak as before at the same echo delay time. So again, the idea is we're increasing our effective bandwidth in order to improve our range resolution by reducing the size of this main lobe. So now that I've shown all the challenges and uh, solutions, right? We talked about the radio frequency interference and then using filtering techniques to remove this RFI, the size of the autocorrelation main lobe and using spectral stitching for a wider bandwidth to improve our resolution. One that I did not talk about here, but I'll uh, uh, discuss later is the fact that the thermal noise is actually greater than the sun power. And we would either need a very long integration time or to concurrently average autocorrelations in order to improve the signal to noise ratio of that echo peak. So now with this system hardware and our signal processing technique, we were ready to try and extract a very clear echo peak in the autocorrelation function. Now, before going back to the Seacliff experiment, we also performed a loopback test in the lab where we transmitted and received a white noise echo to model the sun's reflection. So again, transmitting a white noise echo, attenuating it down to the expected power levels of the sun, and then using multiple chains of amplifiers in order to bring it back above the noise floor and digitize it in our software-defined radio receiver. Now, taking the autocorrelation of that loopback file, again, we were able to extract an echo peak at our expected delay time, meaning that our system was ready for the field. So we went back to the Seacliff experiment and we demonstrated this passive sounding approach using the sun as a source for echo detection. So here's our echo peak. Again, we're measuring the direct path as well as the path that reflects off the ocean and using this autocorrelation to extract an echo peak at roughly 82.9 meters, where this red line corresponds to the expected height of the cliff using Google Earth. Now that we showed it worked for the mirror-like ocean surface, we were interested in showing this technique work for a rougher surface echo, as well as what happens uh, with a two-dimensional imaging technique. So the experimental setup is very similar as before. We're on the side of a desert cliff. We're measuring the sun's direct path, as well as the path that reflects off of the desert floor, and then try to use our autocorrelation-based technique as before. Now the system hardware for this was a little bit different. We use low noise amplifiers, which a much lower noise figure because we're expecting a rougher surface echo. So we want to take into account that signal into the signal and noise ratio. Uh, in this experiment, we were again using our EDIS software refined radio receiver. Here we're measuring at a center frequency of 330 megahertz. We're using an instantaneous bandwidth of 15.36 megahertz, an integration time of eight seconds, which is an integration time that uh, you know, is sufficient in order to bring the sun signal back up above the noise floor in the autocorrelation. So using this system hardware, we went to Death Valley, and our goal was again to extract the autocorrelation from a rougher surface. So here we're receiving the sun's direct signal, as well as the path that reflects off of the desert floor. And using our autocorrelation-based approach, we were able to extract an echo peak that corresponds to roughly 3.3 microseconds, where these red lines show the relative, any uncertainty in the delay time based on the estimated sun's elevation angle using sun earth tools at the time of the measurement, the height of the cliff using Google earth and any local slope of the Death Valley floor, which could again, impact the expected delay time. But we're within the bounds and we were really excited with this result. This uh, experiment also allowed us the chance to take advantage of the sun's moving uh, reflection point, right? As the sun changes its angle throughout the entire day, the sun's moon reflection point, we should be able to extract off of the rougher desert floor. So by using the stationary receiver and the moving source, this could allow us to potentially perform two-dimensional imaging. So first looking at just trying to detect changes in range of the sun echo, here I'm showing two different times where we have the expected 
autocorrelation echo peak at 3.3 microseconds, and then a different time where we expected uh, 5.9 microseconds, where again, these red lines are showing the uncertainty in the delay time based on the estimated sun's elevation angle, high cliff, and local slope at Death Valley floor. Now, in addition to showing uh, detected changes in range, we are also interested in performing two-dimensional passive imaging. The idea is very similar to the batches algorithm for passive radar, where you take your signal that you receive and you segment it into smaller chunks, and you perform a cross-correlation in those chunks, in this case, an autocorrelation from our uh, received signal. And then by aligning uh, them, the range profiles in the expected slow time direction, and then taking a direct Fourier transform in slow time, this can then give us a range Doppler image. So for the, our case, we use the sun as our signal of opportunity. And our technique, instead of receiving with two receivers, was only receiving with one antenna to reduce the complexity and then estimate the autocorrelation using FFT computations. So showing the results from our two-dimensional image formation, here on the left, I'm showing the real aperture result using a 0.25 integration time, and then the unfocused result after using the batches algorithm, uh, 0.25 second integration time. And what I want to highlight is the impact of the integration time. So as we go from 0.25 seconds to 0.5 seconds to, zero, to one second to two seconds, what you can see in this case is the increase in signal and noise ratio, which is what we expect by increasing the integration time. Now, the other thing we can do is we can use these range lines and look across the range lines and this echo power, this echo peak as plotted here, to, again, extract the echo peak power and show how this enables us to detect changes in reflectivity of the sun's echo. Now, why do we think this change in reflectivity? Well, the received power is equal to the convolution of our signal and then the ground reflectivity. So this shows how we can use this echo peak power in order to extract changes in reflectivity, which is really important, especially when you think about trying to detect changes in reflectivity from the sur subsurface of a glacier. Now we're also interested in detecting changes in phase of the sun's echo. So here I'm showing the expected Death Valley sun velocity, where you can see as a time of day, the expected sun velocity is moving, which makes sense, right? We have a moving sun source. And on the right, I'm showing the phase of the autocorrelation echo peak versus time. And what this shows is that by extracting this phase signal, which is what we expected based off the linear fit, we can extract this phase signal to obtain very fine range measurements, which is again important when we think about studying the interior of glaciers and their small movements, especially for internal layers. So now that I show that this worked for the Death Valley case, we're ready to go to an ice sheet and perform field testing at Store Glacier Greenland to use this technique to measure ice thickness, again, using the sun as a signal of opportunity. Now, in this case, uh, here I'm showing you know, our setup nearby a camp. We, we moved further away for the uh, actual result. But here you can just see our setup where we have our uh, antennas, we have you know, our software-defined radio, and then I'm, getting, I'm programming the software-defined radio receiver here. Now, using this technique, uh, we are, again, receiving the sense direct path, as well as the path that propagates through the ice, reflects off the bed, and is received a delay time later. Using the autocorrelation-based technique, we're able to extract an echo peak at the expected delay time of roughly 10.1 microseconds, which maps to an ice thickness measurement of 1,000 meters. And we validated this 1,000 meter measurement by using both a Greenland ice sheet model, as well as active radar measurement surveys near the test site, where again, these red lines show the expected ranges of expected ice thickness measurements. So in addition to, you know, validating the expected delay time, we did additional system checks one of them looking at the histogram of our data, right? We would expect if we're receiving a white noise signal that both the real data and the imaginary data should map to a Gaussian distribution. And if you look at the histogram of the power spectral density, we would also expect that this would match an exponential distribution, which would be the statistics of the received signal that has white noise characteristics. Additionally, we modeled the power spectral density for the voltages of the sun, the galactic background noise, our load noise amplifiers in the overall system to determine the amount of integration time required in order to bring, again, that sun echo peak above the noise floor. And we had sufficient integration time using our eight seconds of integration time and then also using coherent summation. So I also want to show the results of our signal processing technique. Right? I talked before about how we use radio frequency interference removal in order to improve the signal noise ratio. So on the top, I'm showing the result before performing radio frequency interference removal. And we can see is there's multiple spikes in the autocorrelation that potentially could hide our measurement. 
But after performing this radio frequency interference removal using the technique that I described before, the PSD thresholding technique, we're able to extract a very clear peak that corresponds again to that sun echo. Additionally, I want to show the results of using coherent summation. So on the top, each of these different colors corresponds to individual autocorrelation measurements. And then on the bottom shows their coherently summated autocorrelation result, where you can, again, very clearly see the expected peak at the autocorrelation. So now that we show this is possible, one of the key questions going forward is, what is the expect extent of passive sounding spatial and temporal coverage? When we think about this technique, where would it be most useful? especially during the times of the year, right? We have to consider the geometry of the sun signal, the geometry of Jupiter's radio emissions as well, and also what locations are at most risk and where would this be most useful? Now, first we started by projecting the passive soundings performance. We take into account all of our signal losses due to attenuation, reflection, and transmission, as well as all of our system gains by considering what is our maximum amount of integration time, and then computing the signal to noise ratio using this model to obtain the expected signal to noise ratio at different test sites. So here I'm showing the signal to noise ratio for our stored glacier test site using the maximum integration time, so that we would expect at max we could obtain a signal to noise ratio of roughly 23 dB in the ideal case. Now, this is just for a single location, and we are interested in performing this projection across all of Greenland and Antarctica. So keep this in mind, the signal to noise ratio using the maximum integration time. Now, plotting that signal to noise ratio using the maximum integration time for Greenland for three times a year, here I'm showing the summer, the equinox, and the winter, you can get an idea of where this technique would be most useful and at what times of the year. For example, if you look at the Greenland signal to noise ratio map in the winter, you can see that the majority of Greenland ice sheet is blue, meaning SNR less than zero, which makes sense because the sun is not above the horizon in Greenland for that time of the year. However, if you look at the signal to noise ratio for both the summer and the equinox, you can see that the signal to noise ratio is sufficient, say greater than 20 dB, for a large regions of the ice sheet, which is great, meaning that this technique can be used to study Greenland for several months of the year where again, the signal noise ratio greater than 10 dB is desirable. Now we also did this for the Antarctica case. Here I'm showing the SNR map for Antarctica on the left for the summer, as well as SNR map uh, for the equinox on the right. Again, the signal noise ratio, we want something greater than 10 dB in order to obtain a me meaningful measurement. And also if you think about additional measurements such as in glacial water storage, it's really important that we have high signal noise ratio. Now, what you'll notice for the Antarctica SNR maps, right, is these really bright regions corresponding to the ice shelves. And this is expected when you think about the reflection from an ice ocean interface versus, say, an ice bedrock interface. So using this technique might be really beneficial, again, for those ice shelf measurements. Now, looking at Antarctica for a later time of the year, I didn't plot the summer, or, sorry, I didn't plot uh, the winter for Antarctica, mainly because the entire ice sheet was blue at that point, but you can get an idea as the sun starts to go below the horizon, where you can see that, well, at least the ice shelves are still on the table, but unfortunately, the entire ice sheet, Antarctica, in this case, is not available for passive sounding using the sun. Now that I show that this is possible, the next uh, step that I want to talk about is, again, we've demonstrated a technique that allows for us to potentially have a cost-effective continuous monitoring at the ice sheet scale. We talked, though, about the limitations of this technique in terms of the temporal availability of the sun, which really highlights the need for other ambient radio sources, which I'll talk about in the second part of my talk. We're now, I'm going to move towards a planetary uh, system where we're trying to design and analyze a passive HF rare that can use Jupiter's radio emissions for mission concepts, not just to Europa, but its availability at Earth as well. Now, one of the reasons we're interested in performing passive radar sounding using Jupiter's radio emissions is if you think about the Europa Clipper mission, one of the instruments is the radar for Europa assessment and sounding ocean and near surface. So it has both an HF 9 megahertz radar system, as well as a VHF 60 megahertz radar system. The 60 megahertz is more interested in observing the near surface features such as chaos terrain or uh, in glacial, or sorry, water storage systems near the surface, as well as the HF system, which is really interested in the deep sounding, deep probing all the way to that ice ocean interface, uh, potentially observing this liquid ocean beneath Europa's icy shell. Now, 
while this is really interesting and really uh, beneficial, if they can get this to work, one of the issues with the HF radar system is the fact that Jupiter's radio emissions are a very powerful ambient noise source in the HF band. You can essentially think of Jupiter as a jammer to that HF radar system, where here is the decimetric fluxes of Jupiter's radio emissions, which is much greater than the galactic background noise. In fact, over five orders of magnitude greater than the galactic background noise. Essentially, what's happening is Jupiter's magnetosphere is interacting with particle from the IO plasma torus to produce these very strong decimetric bursts. So when Jupiter is active, and the Europa Clipper with the reason instrument is on the subjovian side. This can introduce additional noise into our radar system. So instead of viewing, say, an active sounding noise free case where we can clearly define the surface and look at near surface features, we would instead see a case that has a bunch of noise in it. For example, an active sounding with white noise that corresponds to Jupiter's radio emissions being very loud and blasting, acting as a jammer for our radar. Now, one of our co-authors had the idea of, instead of fighting Jupiter's radio emissions, what if we used it as a source for passive radar sounding? Again, the idea is very similar, right? We receive Jupiter's incoming radio signals, as well as the signals that reflect off of the surface and then the ocean ice subsurface, then use an autocorrelation-based technique to extract the echo peak corresponding to an altimetric measurement, as well as a sounding measurement, trying to obtain an estimate of the ice shell of Europa. So we simulate this technique. Uh, we simulate a passive star approach that can use Jupiter's radio emissions. We defined a sensor geometry flying over, say, the surface of Europa using an incoming Jovian plane wave, as well as its reflections off of the surface, where we have some receiver flying over the surface. We create a synthetic uh, DEM, where we consider here an overview of the ridge, right? Here's our track, and then here's flying over this ridge, where this ridge is something that I want you to keep in mind, because we'll try to obtain and extract the properties of this ridge as we fly over in our simulation. To show the parameters for our simulation, we are interested in SAR simming, uh, imaging using a back projection approach. Here I'm showing both the signal powers for the passive case, in this case, a flux density of 10 to the minus 14, and active power, uh, active simulation using 10 watts. Uh, Transmitter. Our center frequency is that 9 megahertz HF band that I told you about before with a 1 megahertz bandwidth. Now, if you look at the integration time of our passive measurement, you see that's 100 microseconds, which is much less than the eight seconds that we use for the terrestrial experiment. Uh, so 100 microsecond integration time, the reason we chose this really short integration time is we wanted something comparable to an active chirp length. For example, the chirp length would be roughly 20 microseconds in this case. And then we define the PRF, sensor velocity, seeing the altitude, and our aperture size will be the size of a Fresnel zone. So again, receiving this plane wave, our reference plane, and then considering the individual contributions coming from facets from scattering, we then delay and sum using a back projection approach in order to focus our signal to obtain better azimuth resolution and better signal noise ratio. So showing first the results for the active radar simulation, on the left I'm showing the range compressed power image. Again, since this is an active radar simulation, we would expect very clear recovery of that ridge that I showed before. If you take the SAR process technique, you can also see how this improves the signal noise ratio as well as the azimuth resolution, which again is what we'd expect for an active technique. However, we want to show that this could also work for the passive case. So now showing the results for the passive simulation, I'm showing the passive range compressed image on the left and the passive SAR result on the right. Now you can barely recover this uh, surface signal, which is expected, again, because of the short integration time that we use. And we also want to highlight how we could use passive star focusing in order to improve the signal and noise ratio for our technique. So here again, we obtain better uh, signal noise ratio, as well as improvements in azimuth resolution using passive star focusing. And again, we use the parameters I described before, which are based off of the Ryman reason instruments for the Europa mission. Now that we show that we recover the surface signal, we are also interested in using this approach to characterize Europa's ionosphere. So if we consider a passive HF radar flying alongside a VHF radar, so VHF radar, we could use this as a low resource approach to correct for ionospheric dispersion, ionospheric dispersion being signal delay and pulse broadening, which really messes up the accuracy of your measurement. So if we're using Jupiter's radio emissions now, receiving again that direct path, as well as the path that propagates through the ionosphere, 
and then receives a reflection off of the surface, we can use that information from the HF signal and combine it with the VHF radar system in order to correct for iron spheric dispersion. Now, again, I said that iron spheric dispersion relates to both delay and pulse broadening. So here's an example of the delay, the expected delay for both the 60 megahertz and 9 megahertz system. You can see that the delay time for the 9 megahertz is much more significant. And again, this is important when we think about accurate altimetric measurements. Then the other thing to take into account is both the range resolution for the 60 megahertz and the 9 megahertz system. So again, what this is showing is that the HF system, that 9 megahertz system, is much more severely impacted by that ionospheric dispersion, where now your range resolution is going to suffer significantly, as well as the delay time in your signal. So simulating what this delay in pulse broadening might look like for both the VHF case in the HF case, here the blue corresponds to the charge-free result as if there were no ion sphere, the red showing the ion sphere result using a total electron content expected at Europa. What you can see for the blue result is that there's no ion sphere dispersion, which makes sense. But for the red result, you can see how this ion sphere introduces this pulse broadening, uh, both for the main lobe as well as the side lobes, right? as well as that delay time uh, that I described before. So you see both the effects of delay time and pulse broadening for the VHF case. Now it's relatively minor for the VHF case. It's much more significant for this HF case. So in addition to that uh, expected delay time move right here, there's additional pulse broadening in the main lobe. And there's also a decrease in the signal and noise ratio, which is further showing the impacts of the ionosphere on the HF result. But there is a technique to correct for this. It's using the relative delay time between this VHF and this HF signal. So now using this uh, reference-based approach that I was alluding to, we use the relative delay time between the active VHF signal and the passive HF signal. We use that relative delay time to estimate the total electron content and perform phase compensation in order to correct for the ionospheric dispersion. So here, this blue line corresponds again to the charge-free result as if there are no ionosphere, the red result showing the ionosphere impacts, and again, that delay and pulse broadening, and then the yellow corresponding to the corrected result. So after we perform that phase compensation, again, using this reference-based approach. And this shows that now we can obtain really accurate measurements with our VHF radar signal, uh, again, for altimetric purposes. So now plotting this uh, you know, expected error in the TAC and expected error in the range, we can show that for all realistic values of Europa's total electron content and all realistic values of passive HF integration times, we can actually reduce this error in our total electron content to really small numbers, both for uh, the total electron content, and then again for the range error. So if we're interested in reducing the range error to less than three meters for altimetry purposes and sounding, this allows us to do so using an integration time of, say, roughly greater than 0.1 seconds. Additionally, we showed how the various pathways of Jupiter's radio emissions could be used to invert the latitudinal and vertical structure of the ionosphere. So if we're obtaining estimates of those total electron content measurements, we can use the various pathways during a given flyby over a wide range of instance angles to, again, perform in uh, ionospheric tomography. Now, what does this mean in terms of the eccentricity, right? We know that an ionosphere is not perfectly homogeneous. There's going to be some variations to the daytime and nighttime. If we look at, say, the estimated error in the total electron content as a function of this eccentricity parameter, if we, say, had a perfectly homogeneous ionosphere, this would mean that we could obtain really small errors in the total electron content up to a wide range of instance angles. Now, for uh, Europa's ionosphere, we would expect ionospheric eccentricity of roughly 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So this still shows how we could use large angles of incidence up to, say, 15 degrees in order to perform this passive ionospheric tomography. Again, exploiting the passive off Nadir geometry in this case. So these were some examples of the planetary aspects of this technique. Uh, but going forward, I'm interested in a wide range of passive radar sensing problems, both from a radar signal processing and radar system design aspect, as well as modeling passive radar performance and looking at different mission concepts. I'm going to talk for the rest of the time about a few of the problems that a few of my students are working on. So one of them being this passive radar signal processing development. Uh, there's additional research, not just using ambient radio noise, but of course, recycling anthropogenic sources, such as FM radio, 
TV stations, we've seen GPS, GNSS, how they use other man-made sources for passive radar sensing. I'm also interested in looking at passive SAR imaging algorithms where we can use perhaps deep learning to perform image reconstruction, especially for incoherent sources such as Jupiter or the sun. And then finally, adaptive radar signal processing techniques, where here's an example of using the clean algorithm for an FM uh, station in order to obtain a better signal to noise ratio, and how we can use similar techniques for our passive sounding case. For example, we can solve this direct path problem, passive sounding, very similarly by using a direct signal suppression approach. Here we show adaptive signal adaptive direct signal suppression for a single channel passive radar in order to improve the signal noise ratio of our ambient noise passive sounding. The idea is that the direct path serves as a source of interference itself. So not just the radio frequency interference, the direct path is also a source of interference. The idea being it's much greater than the reflected path in terms of power. So if you were to take the autocorrelation of just the direct path itself and then compare it to the autocorrelation of the passive measurement, you can see that the direct path itself introduces a lot of noise in our measurement. So this direct path interference is something we would like to avoid and remove from our system. So if you were to take the autocorrelation before direct signal suppression, you can see the signal to noise ratio is relatively low in this case roughly 7 dB. But if you were to perform direct signal suppression, this could actually improve your signal and noise ratio greater than 10 dB in order to obtain, again, a better estimate of your echo peak, as well as increase the depth sensitivity for your measurement and increase the extent of passive sounding spatial coverage. Now, another problem is performing this Jovian burst demonstration using echo detection of Jovian burst, very similarly to what I did with both the Sea Cliff experiment as well as the Death Valley experiment. So here's an example of a potential setup at Dante's View Death Valley, uh, looking at when Jupiter is above the horizon. And this is important to consider because now the sun will act as an additional source of interference to Jupiter's radio emissions. So we have to take into account when Jupiter is above the horizon, uh, when the sun is above the horizon, when both the sun and Jupiter are above the horizon. So it looks like ideally, we would try to perform this experiment uh, roughly at midnight to 4 a.m. or later in the evening when, again, the sun is below the horizon, but Jupiter is above the horizon. Another aspect of the research is trying to identify what is the extent of the spatial coherence constraints for terrestrial passive sounding. When we think about the sun case using uh, passive sounding on Earth, we have to take into account what is our maximum altitude due to the spatial coherence of our source. Since we have an incoherent source, this limits our maximum use of altitude, both as a function of wavelength and by static angle. So you can see here how if we were to move towards shorter wavelengths or higher frequencies, this would significantly limit our maximum altitude, potentially constraining us to only ground-based experiments. Additionally, if you were to look at the pulse broadening using the sun signal at Earth, you can see that pulse broadening is very significant, extending over hundreds of samples for an echo peak to be observed for very large altitudes. Again, meaning that for the sun case, we're constraining our, our, uh, our passive sounding to lower altitudes. And this highlights the need for using Jupiter's radio emissions. Again, Jupiter's radio emissions, since it's a smaller source size, it enables us to obtain greater maximum altitudes. Here I'm showing the Jovian burst case for the Europa mission. Here we would look at maximum altitude, again, considering the spatial extent of the source for Jupiter's radio emissions, both as a function of wavelength and by static angle. And what you can see is that we can go up to roughly 1,000 kilometers for uh, reasonable wavelengths and reasonable biostatic angles. And if you, additionally, if you were to look at pulse broadening at Europa, you can see that the pulse broadening is much, uh, much less significant. There's pulse broadening that's less than 10 samples for our autocorrelation echo peak, which is great, meaning this, this technique can be used for higher altitudes than the sun case. And finally, I want to show one research project that looks at analyzing the shallow radar Sherrod solar radio burst candidates for passive sounding at Mars. We've identified a list of candidates with Christopher Rekos at UTIC that have potential solar, solar radio bursts directed by Sherrod. We're interested in looking at the geometry of these bursts, right? Both the sun signal as well as Mars, and then the locations of stereo A and stereo B, in addition to Sherrod, to try to identify why we're missing some of these solar radio bursts that should be detected. And additionally, we want to see if these solar radio bursts can be used as a signal for subsurface sounding. So this would have really important implications when thinking about additional sources and additional source sizes that can be used for passive sounding.
And finally, I'm interested in miniaturizing this technique and having it production ready. If we think about our passive radar design and future mission concepts, we could have very large array-based passive sounding imagers. We can also have ambient radio noise tomography where we have very large offsets performing massive uh, cross correlations in a MIMO configuration. And then finally, the final implementation would be very similar to say Sunrise or Cygnus, where we can have these really small passive radar sounders on board for spaceborne missions. So to conclude, starting from theory, simulation, and lab bench testing, my research demonstrated passive radar sounding using the sun as a radio source to measure ice sheet thickness for the first time. Passive radar sounding could enable continuous and widespread monitoring of Antarctica's and Greenland's subsurface conditions and serve as a low resource sensor to probe the icy moons of Jupiter. And finally, my current research uh, focuses on providing a rich understanding of the technique by projecting ambient noise passive radar performance and potential limitations when designing future radar sounding missions. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. I'd like to acknowledge all my co-authors and collaborators on this work, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sean, for that presentation. Uh, if folks have questions, um, you can either uh, put them into the chat or raise your digital hand, and I will unmute you. I guess while we wait for those to come in, um, an opening question I have, one of the things that we often talk about in these seminars uh, are novel concepts like the ones you presented and their pathway uh, to flight and production. Um, so in your case, I guess production is both deployment on the ground and integration into some of those missions that you talked about at the end. So I wonder if you could talk more about sort of the, the technical maturation path you see in moving from these software defined radios to being able to do these larger scale deployments deployments yeah thank you Dusty. i think uh, i'm attacking this with a pronged approach where right now i'm looking at onboard signal processing techniques so i talked about that direct signal suppression technique if that's something that could be implemented on board to perform you know increases in signal noise ratio Another technique would be onboard signal processing, looking at that radio frequency interference removal, right? If we think about removing the radio frequency interference or at least flagging which measurements are useful and not useful, that'll be really important for future deployments as well. Uh, we've also started looking at, you know, what would be the system design for something that is really low resource? Like if you think about developing something with ASICs or looking at, you know, very small chips that are just receiver chips, Right, we're not trying to transmit anything uh, currently. We're just trying to perform this onboard processing and then perform the passive measurement uh, using a very low cost system. That would be the next steps for this technique. I think the space borne missions is really far away. Uh, currently, I'm focusing on the onboard processing problem. And then the next step would be trying to get that smaller scale production ready uh, chip. Great, we have a question here in the chat which says, what kind of information about subsurface conditions can be determined by the relative amplitude of the return signal? Yes, yeah, so when we think about subsurface conditions, uh, we're interested in a wide range of those conditions. We're interested in, say, the reflectivity coming from the bed. That gives us information of whether what's at the bed is, say, water or till or bedrock. So that's one potential source of information. Another potential source of information could be the attenuation rates. We're really interested in studying the attenuation rates because they also have implications of the temperature as well. And then finally, we can potentially look at the chemistry. Uh, the chemistry is really important, especially when you think about the internal layers. And they're, uh, they're essentially mapping a story similar to tree rings of what has occurred going back in the history using the glaciological history. So I in to rank them, I'd probably say reflectivity first, uh, attenuation second, because the attenuation can also, in addition to that temperature, can also be due to, say, in glacial water storage as well. So to answer your question, there's a wide range of conditions. Um, this is something that is heavily uh, looked at in you know, radio glaciology using active radar systems. So I think it's a very exciting path forward for this. Great. Um, it says we wait for other questions. Uh, another question I would have, uh, it seems a lot of your presentation focused on removing 
RFI or dealing with other noise sources that that the filtering and signal processing uh, is a huge part of the problem. You mentioned processing uh, on board as a way to deal with this, but you can also imagine if you brought all the data down, which is my understanding of what you're sort of doing now, that you might be able to pursue more exotic and computationally intensive signal processing to try and really beat down the noise. I wonder if you could maybe speak to what the trade-offs there are, how important is the quality of the noise removal and, and how can that performance be enabled by processing uh, all of the data versus how it, how it would perform if you were performing it like in the instrument or before you downlink, say, the data from a deployment? Yeah, absolutely. So this is something that the passive seismology community uh, considers in great detail. So, for example, they would download terabytes of data and then perform, you know, these really exotic signal processing approaches, uh, much more exotic than, say, receiving and gen removing RFI and stacking. So there is a large trade-off to answer your question. I think if you want something on board, you want something really computationally efficient, like that, you know, really fast RFI thresholding technique. You would want something where you can rapidly flag and filter RFI. Is this a useful measurement? Is this something that is not useful? Uh, and something that can perform direct signal expression where, again, if you're using a frequency domain approach, you should be able to do that on board. Now, again, to answer your question, there's that's, that's the onboard processing side of it. Uh, if we're looking at more exotic approaches, I think this is where we start getting into the conversation of this signal uh, using synthetic aperture radar approaches, looking at, for example, when you think about the synthetic aperture radar, we have to consider, again, the phase recovery. Um, this is really important when we have this radio frequency interference removal. So it's something where I'm not sure if we could do this on board. This would have to be demonstrated before we try to do uh, the more exotic, say, either back projection or deep learning approaches that I talked about at the end. So I think for the exotic cases, we might need to do this you know, something on uh, a computer, on a laptop. Uh, for the onboard processing stuff, my hope is, again, that we can use both direct signal suppression and RFI flag and filtering. Great. Other questions in the chat or uh, by hand? I guess as we wait for those, uh, another question I might ask, um, you know, you're mentioning recycling anthropogenic sources. I imagine those are not white noise sources. And so is there a way to think about sort of what these comparatively, I guess, narrow band sources uh, would add? Do you imagine them being combined with your uh, sort of astronomical sources? Or do you imagine putting together a lot of them? Or ha have you have you done any evaluation of, of what they would add? Yeah, that's that's a great point as well. So here's an example, you know, showing FM radio stations. I know there's a lot of work uh, with P-band signals. There's a lot of work with GPS, GNSS. And if you think about those center frequencies, right, GPS, um, you know, being much higher at say L-band uh, 1.2, uh, this, you know, being at 100 megahertz, P-band being at roughly 400 megahertz, this could give you uh, frequency diversity in trying to study these different features of interest. Now, another thing that you mentioned is perhaps combining your effective bandwidth. And that's really interesting when you think about that spectral stitching technique. Uh, we would have to see if, because of the coherence of those sources, like you suggested, if the spectral stitching could work for a coherent source the same way that works for an incoherent source. Now, if it could, if you could combine your effective bandwidth by combining all of those sources, that would be really cool. I know that there are some works uh, with bandwidth extension techniques uh, using, say, you know, power filling in between, uh, you know, these different frequencies, and then using uh, spectral estimation techniques to increase your overall effective bandwidth. So to answer your question, I know that there is some work looking into bandwidth extension techniques for those coherent sources. I think it would be great to combine it with the incoherent sources as well to, again, increase your overall effective bandwidth. And that improves your range resolution as, as you were uh, saying. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking time uh, to present here. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, please yeah, come see us next month.
And as always, uh, these recordings are posted on our uh, IEEE Geoscience Remote Sensing YouTube channel. So take a look at uh, the previous talks as well. So thanks again, Sean, for coming and see you all next month. Thank you, Dusty.